Clinton and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And joining us tonight is Chris King. He is a philosopher specializing in research ethics. Chris, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thanks for having me. Should mention he's pretty dead sexy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. Very mediocre sexy. Oh, Oh, okay. Eh. Sad, sad. No, totally. Okay, anyway. So, uh, Chris, uh, let, yeah, tell people about you. Who are you? Where'd you come from? Where were you born? Sure. sure. Oh, I don't, you know, I was born in New Jersey, which is a terrible, a little more of an admission than, uh, than anything else. Uh, but no, uh, my, I, my ancestors actually spent a few hundred years there yeah, yeah. and got so out in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. So, so they knew. <laughs> Chris Chrissy hasn't figured it out yet, or maybe he has. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Living high, high on the hog. You know? right. he's, he's doing all right. Um, so, Three you know, vacations. I've been out on the West Coast for a few years. Um, I moved here in high school and, and uh, left and did the military thing uh, and came back for college. And I went to a private Christian college that's here in Seattle. Or in Seattle and and uh, uh, and have been kind of out here ever since. I went. I had a couple years in graduate school um, that I went to in, in New York. But I've been out here and pretty attached to this place for for several years now. Nice. It's a, it's a great place to live. It is a great place to ha- raise a family and all. That. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I work uh, for some research institutions, and I uh, work in research ethics, which is just uh, reviewing research that involves human subjects to make sure that it's uh, that it is relatively safe um, for people to be involved in, or that they have a good plan for um, for uh, dealing with risk, or we're going to have a conversation about risk and play that kind of a thing out. Really? So if there's like a company that wants to set up some sort of uh research project and they want subjects to come in and they'll pay them like 50 bucks, you know, to be a participant, you would perhaps uh, check out their uh, trials and make sure that everything's legit. That's right. Yeah. I would, I would want to make sure that a, they're having, they're getting consent and having a good discussion with participants, but then also make sure that their procedures are, don't include things like, you know, the, none of the researchers are making money off of this project or, uh, making sure that, uh, people are well qualified to conduct the research is a, is a big feature of the work. Um, and just make sure that it's kind of high quality, high quality research. Okay. okay. So basically trying to make sure people don't do what Facebook did when they were, tweaking people's uh, feeds to try to make them more annoying or fun for people without them knowing about it to see if they could affect their mood. Did you hear about that one? Uh, oriented research that 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 has that kind of goes on that's in that vein. I mean, Facebook w- wasn't the only group to do that because uh, there's lots of information about people available on the internet, and uh, there's a there's a really uh, interesting ethical question about uh, both about privacy concerns, about getting consent, um, about um, I guess related to privacy, but identifying people where they are and just um, and you know those are. Those are things that are definitely worth being concerned about. Uh, but on the on the flip side, there's a there's a lot of interesting things to learn about people, uh, both f- for uh, people who work uh, in business and want to know more about their clients or the potential customers. Uh, but then also for social scientists that try to make sense of things like uh, you know shopping habits or eating habits, what causes people to ch- change their minds about things. Um, so there's a lot of great fodder um, in, in there. But, you know, people, if I think if people are careful and thoughtful about how they collect their data, um, then I th- there's a, there is a responsible way to, to carry out and get that information from people. Nice. I've been, uh, from the stuff that I've seen about this whole Facebook thing, though, I really think that should have been an opt-in kind of thing, though, that people should choose to be a part of it. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I have a feeling that I might have been a victim of that because I, I felt like a serious asshole for a while. So I'm thinking they're feeding me like stuff to make me angry. 
<laughs> During that period, I, I was finding like every like four days, I would just reach the point where I just couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. And yeah. every couple of weeks, I'd have to just take like a, a day off from Facebook. They were they were getting you. <laughs> that or I just have the wrong friends. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that. There's always well, that. <laughs> if you look at my Facebook bio, it is just one word. It says asshole. <laughs> so, <laughs> there might be something to that. Uh, so like how does the, the whole consent aspect work when it comes to you know ethical research yeah it can be tricky um i i think you know well i, I should say the consent process is really pretty straightforward um you know and consent in general is pretty straightforward we can have a conversation uh about it and you want to make you know the you know, only big thing is making sure that you're talking with a person or communicating with a person in a way that they can understand you mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's consent's like, simple. Informed consent is not. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, and an informed consent gets a little bit, um, it gets, you know, it depends on the content. I'd say that most of the research that I do, and most of it is in developing countries, uh, but most of the stuff that I see is uh, really straightforward study designs, uh, really straightforward study goals, um, uh, things that are pretty easy to, uh, see the benefit versus the risk, um, and to uh, and 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 people can make a pr and I think that people even uh, who don't come from robust school systems or robust educational systems uh, can make a pretty decent decision about these things. Um, uh, and this is and this is true for you know educational or programmatic evaluation things, but I think that's also true for um, for you know we're going to do this clean water study in your community. Uh, we're going to be passing out this filter or this device, and we're going to see if it works for you and your family for a little while. I think that people, that's a thing that uh, people can get on board with and understand what they're doing. Um, and so, uh, so, so I think that that part of the process isn't, isn't too muddled to the extent that you're willing to say what you want to do. Um, I guess it can get tricky for uh, uh, studies that are um, stage three and four clinical trials where you have, you know, the double blind feature or you have placebo uh, aspects of your study. Um, there's the, the questions become the ethical questions become a little heavier, but you know, that's, that's downstream. And usually those studies are, are well supported by the time they get to the stage three and four. Uh, I think the thing that actually be, that is kind of tricky and develop in the kind of research that I see is the engaging the participants, right? So a person goes to a hospital, they have, they present for something, my, whatever, my nose is bleeding all the time. Uh, they, they go to a, uh, a nurse or, or, you know, a practitioner and they're like, oh, they, they know about a study that deals with whatever symptoms you're presenting with or mm -hmm. whatever, diagno whatever diagnosis they give you. And, and either they go ask a study team member you know, uh, or they refer you to a study team and they have this discussion with you. Or sometimes the, um, it is the case that your physician is kind of, is, is an authority figure plus. He's not just, he or she is not just the person who has all this knowledge, but they're actually, that person actually has a key into your village and your village is health. And so when you ha have a situation like that, getting consent or getting participants, uh, that are, you know, that you just, that you, aren't worried about becomes a little a little more difficult if that makes sense yeah yeah oh yeah it definitely does there's uh, definitely a whole range of how it can all go <laughs> and, it definitely can. yeah definitely glad that especially when, it, when it's coming to places in the developing world that they are actually getting you know trained philosophers to to help with making sure they're doing it right yeah it's interesting you know actually one of the a little bit of the research I do comes in a sexy flavor. Well, literally and, and sort of figuratively sexy. So uh, sometimes uh, the organization I work with does uh, studies on gay men or men who have sex with men. And in some of the places that we do it, it's illegal. And so how do you get study participants? You know, how do you do this? Uh, you know, do you put a sign outside of your your lab and say, gay men come here for a research study? It doesn't really work like that. <laughs> Um, and right. so they have, you have to have creative ways of reaching out to participants too. And I, I've been most surprised uh, in the research ethics world, or all, in all of research, in fact, uh, by how people um, have to come up with clever ways to uh, get research participants in the house. Yeah, that'd be a hell of a trick. It is. It's tricky. There's lots of word of mouth, and uh, or you know, uh, 
something like you go to you go to the research uh, place to get your procedure done or whatever, and they give you a couple of tickets to give to your couple of friends, and this is a pretty popular way to to get people in. But it's you know it's, you have to be creative. So yeah, huh. yeah. Any interesting ones that you've worked on that that uh, you're at liberty to talk about? Um, well, there's a couple. F- uh, yeah, so I've been working there long enough to where there's some popular ones. So there was a big, probably uh, fourteen thousand person study in India on HPV. And mm. uh, when I when I first started doing this work, that was uh, a thing that we uh, that we reviewed and approved. And uh, that study, and uh, I should and it's a cluster of studies, really. But the the one the big one that I have in mind, um, it was uh, went for a few years. Um, study participants died for all kinds of reasons. You know, some ran away, uh, some a few of them drowned. People got in car accidents and all kinds of things. Uh, and it was right around the time that. Uh, the autism vaccine thing was kind of going on. Mm-hmm. And, and so there was an Australian vaccine network, I think, who really hopped on uh, the this study and sort of the, um, the adverse events list. I don't know how they got it or whatever, but they hopped on this list and published all kinds of really wild, you know, just blatantly untrue things and just lots of speculation. And it was kind of interesting to see uh, how the world responded to that, especially the health world, the WHO and other, and other big health groups respond to that um and and as well to understand and and it was also interesting to see how they understood what was going on in that study so they would tell you you know uh, you know a couple hundred people died in this you know in this study and they don't give you a lot of details about it and you know you know they're pretty much it's an hpv vaccine study uh and lots of people died this is all you need to know it's a problem that kind of a thing uh but Yeah, but, you know, the medicine has been around for a long, long time, you know, for a good enough time. It's very, very well tested. Uh, and, yeah, it was just a, it was a really interesting uh, thing to see, I guess. <laughs> wow. Because, yeah, you ha- anytime somebody that's involved dies, you have to report that. Mm-hmm. Whether it was a part of the study or the study was a factor in that or not, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and you know, and there are, there's a group of people who are watching, who watch studies. Uh, they're called data safety monitoring, uh, a board. It's a board of people and they, they watch the data. They stay on top of the data and there's stopping rules for when research has become too risky for people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so there's a mechanism in place. Uh, and yeah, and still these people, uh, the, the, the people who are anti-vax all over the place, they they can't quite – either they don't know about this or they, I'm not sure what they're thinking about. I, I kind of wonder. But um, it is fascinating. And uh, it is, and all the deaths, you're right. All the deaths and all the adverse events are really well documented. Um, there's even a category of I don't know. So, I mean, even <laughs> if the anti-vax people were like, look, there was like three deaths that nobody knows what happened. And, you know, I guess – People once people realize that you know we're talking about fourteen thousand you know young women or something like that to three deaths that we didn't know about maybe we want to make a fuss about that but you know probably not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I worked in an industry where we had to if with with informed consent issues you know always being being present and if somebody died that had ever come in and donated we had to do an investigation mm-hmm. and in some cases it was. You know, literally five, ten years later, still had to do some documentation, send it off and see if we needed to do further investigation. We had one where it was like three days after we'd last seen him. And it was that was one where there was definitely some concern. And fortunately, we got the information and found out, oh, no, no. If anything, we helped prolong his life. Right. Mm -hmm. I yeah, don't want to go into too many details on that. Right. But, yeah, yeah. No, to, <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is funny how that works. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the real shockers are the, you know, how, I mean, the real shocker is how infrequent, even if, even when it's measured, it still feels uh, less frequent uh, when somebody dies from, you know, from, uh getting, you know, having a needle or whatever, whatever adverse event can happen. I mean, bad things can happen there. You know, when you have 7 billion people, the chances, um, that, that some bad thing is going to feature is it gets pretty high. I mean, you know, you're up to a lot of digits and stuff. So, mm-hmm. uh, no, and even if you're just looking at a pool of a few thousand, mm-hmm. the odds of one of them happen. dying. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's totally going to happen. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> but, man, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, what you're doing there 
Yeah, it's, it's fascinating work. You know, I I don't really, you know, my I'm a, you know, a I'm a philosopher of science by training, and I took another master's degree in, in like a philosophy of physics uh, kind of thing. And so I didn't think that I was going to be doing this kind of work. Uh, and so I, so when I was about halfway through graduate school, I get a call from the organization that I had, I had been kind of working with uh, out of college, and they're like, "Hey, why don't you come back when you're you know you're done doing your thing?" And instead of having to publish and get you know do the teaching thing, I jumped on the opportunity, and it's been kind of I'm really surprised and happily um, happy about not staying in academia. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's time to take a break, and then when we when we come back, uh, let's talk more about your education because okay. that sounds like a, a pretty interesting course of study. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. All right. Yeah, so what was the uh how was the education? <laughs> it was it was good. Um interested in how we go from one theory to another. Um and that comes from a long line. There's a long uh, academic trajectory of people asking that question and finding answers towards it. You probably lots of people have read um Thomas Kuhn's uh The Nature of Scientific Revolutions. Um and, you know, this is where everybody gets this term paradigm shift from, for instance. Um, and I wanted to sort of delve deeper into that question. And so I basically wrote a thesis on how we, how we do that. And then for my other master's degree, it was about the interpretations of quantum mechanics. I wanted, there's, you know, 18 or 20 or so interpretations of quantum mechanics. And I kind of walked through them in my thesis a little bit and pulled out mm-hmm. some nuggets and, you know, made an, a few arguments that, uh, were either fresh or, you know, wrong and just nobody, you know, or just kind of new or something like that. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, get out of graduate school <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> um, but it was really fascinating. I don't, I, um, I was a classics person as an undergrad and, a, and I studied sociology as well. Um, and, uh, I was out, Throughout my, my college trajectory was very much about asking this "how do you know" question, very asking a very um, epistemic and an, um, an epistemology, asking the classical epistemology question about how do we know this and that about knowledge. Um, and physics is really fair and a nice place to hang out uh, for asking this question because they know exactly how they know things. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with the history of philosophy and physics. Um, and yeah, and it just becomes, it becomes, a, it's a question that we should never leave, that never becomes outdated or anything like that. We ought to all the time be able to ask people, how do you know that thing? Um, mm-hmm. And I'm sure you guys have done that many times to people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And I, I definitely have, uh, you know, spent quite a bit of time with the whole epistemology thing when I was uh, going through my theology studies and and trying to figure out how do we actually know that this stuff is is true and uh, actually had a uh, professor I was talking to about some of my doubts when I was in the seminary suggesting that I switch to the Master of Arts program and just study epistemology for several years. I was tempted, but that would have been really expensive. That is how that shakes out too. Like right when you hone in on the question, right when you hone in on the thing that you want, it's like, oh, it just got a whole lot more expensive really fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we are, you know, in the course of making it, you know, the ways, the ways that we grew up, and, you know, and people, uh, you know, I think that the other questions of philosophy are very interesting, you know, the questions about metaphysics and these things. Um, but yeah, it was very nice to sort of laser in hone in on this question uh did you ever find out how how you knew (laughs) (laughs) yeah oh did you dustin go ahead wesley did you find out oh yeah yeah did you ever find out what you did you ever find out how you knew anything when you were in the oh when you were in seminary yes i did i I found out the bible is just a a load of bullshit (laughs) (laughs) yeah that was my final uh final conclusion that you know People claiming to be speaking for God are not reliable witnesses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, did, oh, did man, it was. Please 
could you at least please cite two sources whenever you right. make a claim? They're not even clever about it. I think this. Um. Well, yeah. I. I'm. I get. I get bummed out with having discussions with religious people because they. Um, it's it's just, it's a little bit, I don't know it's it's just kind of a letdown you know you can ask a very good question and maybe you don't get a very good answer all the time I think this is the state of knowledge and you know in reality um, we don't have that great of answers for how we know things compared to ways that we can imagine knowing things um, and so I uh, and so I, I I don't let people off the hook necessarily but I definitely will take it easy on a person who's like yeah I'm not really sure how I know but here's what I'm working with this is a this is a pretty genuine answer all the time. Well, as uh, long as somebody's coming from a, a position that they don't actually know, but they're thinking about it, mm-hmm. I, I, I respect that a lot more than just saying, here's plop, here's what you got. I think that's right. I think that's right. Big time. I mean, you hear scientists all the time in giving public presentations saying things like, I don't really know, or I feel, you know, they give you a fuzzy answer about a thing. Mm-hmm. And the fur- the further on what became the answer, but... Um, totally. But I mean, like, the further they get away from their, their field of expertise, the more they hedge their bets and say, you know, you should talk to that guy over there. Right. And at, at least, least the that. smart ones do. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And they should. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think, you know, my, you know, it's an interesting challenge to be how to be honest um, with with what it is that we know. And I mean, and, you know, what comes before that is setting a standard for how we know things. Um, I, mean, I think that that's that's knowledge that should be freely given out fairly early on. And we shouldn't have to, you know, we shouldn't be I sh- we shouldn't be still having discussions with um, either people who don't know any better or people who might know better but willingly rail against those rules about the standard of how we know things you know and it's not just you know we can do we can do a little better than empiricism we can do a little work with both empiricism and rationalism um you know but just but we shouldn't think that this knowledge thing is all end all and be all never is gonna take up that space and that's a hard i think that's a hard lesson yeah and you know with the the empiricism side at least that can be easily covered in elementary school in science class and then it could also be brought into history class to how do we know that these things that we're saying happened in the past actually happened uh in re- in reality yeah absolutely absolutely i think you know one of my favorite historians or one of my favorite writers has been um michael foucault and i didn't it took me a long time to like i would read his books and i just let the words sort of float over me because he, you know, he wrote in this very, you know, sort of uh, French style, and would go on and on with, the, you know, with the theory for a little bit, and then the examples would kind of go around. But once his work sort of settled in my mind, I really appreciated um, what the way that he talked about his sources. Because he would say, "Hey, look, you know, I'm looking through the records. I'm looking through the medical records or the historical records of this insane asylum, and here's what it is. And here, and then he would lay out an idea about, you know, about what that was. But he was really transparent." about about what he was using as a source um and and he didn't make any claims about the quality or anything like that but he was like here's what is available in terms of records and i really appreciate that uh that flavor of um of academic work because you need to know right where it's coming from yeah and you said foucault and the first thing i i came to mind was Antoine Fuqua, that hor- <laughs> that generally horrible director. Yeah, yeah, okay. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, okay. in, in, you know, thinking like thinking about it with like elementary school education is how would you handle that part? Like with history, would you, do you think it would it'd go easily in the like early years or a little bit later? Gosh, that's, um, you know, I would say that, you know, I never once heard all throughout my education. Uh, you know, it wasn't until maybe my upper courses in undergraduate school or, uh, or yeah, of undergraduate college that I um, first would connect something like a court document to some historical fact. I, it never even occurred to me, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and there's a lot of court documents out there. You know, people get married and divorced. Uh, people are are born and they die. And these are fa- these are facts. Uh, and they're, they're court documents. They're not held by, you know, the hospitals might have some of that stuff. But these are legal documents. Um, and, you know, so demographers, you know, have it kind of easy in terms of getting in terms of getting data. And uh, and I think the struggle, you know, in that discipline is probably just to dig deeper, you know, or whatever it is. But if you're a historian, 
you know, there could be alternative, you know, documents, you know. And so I, I, I think that there's, view. yeah, there's definitely some work to be done in terms of which historical document, you know. So this this court in this county says this thing happened and, and you can go to a court, uh, to a county courthouse in the next county and, and you might get a slightly different thing about the same historical fact, Um I mean, they're not going to disagree so much that it's worth quibbling about, but you're, you might get a little difference, I guess. Mm-hmm. You can you can spin, you can spin as you you can do a little spinning, I guess. Yeah, and then you can find the the newspaper articles from the time period, right? Which are all going to be a little bit different town to town, especially if you're going back before you know the wire was there. Mm-hmm. Possibly even get some some uh, journal entries from people's diaries. Right. Or blogs, whatever's going on then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or Paul's letters like 40, 50 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so reliable. <laughs> and you, you know what's so funny about Paul? So like half of Paul's books are like, this is the real Paul telling the truth about this thing. And like, you know that it's me because I said this. And I was, and I All was, that <laughs> weird third person shit. Yeah. I mean, you know, lots of, you know, lots of. There, I think there's lots of Bible that's really like that, but Paul really like gets me with that stuff. Like, oh, come on. This isn't really Paul. <laughs> oh, and the, the conservative way of explaining that is that, you know, he was, these were all churches that he'd worked with. So they actually knew him and there's probably other letters that we don't have. So they'd be familiar with his writing style and there were, would be people trying to be imposters of him. So obviously he had to try to make the case that it was actually him. Right. Right. <laughs> But that's what he, that's what they said. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, and had to do that to uh, you know outsmart the imposters who would be doing the same exact thing. Yeah, totally. Okay, wait, no, this is really me for sure. Toads, it's toads. Toads. <laughs> Okay, but no, that other guy, that other letter, not not me. This one's me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> really? All right, that's the best you got. Right. And but yet, I, there we, aren't any parts that say no. That that one, you, that other one, wasn't me. That didn't, never made it. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely, definitely we got all the real ones in there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, complete with different vocabulary and uh, writing styles. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, too. Yeah, as a classics person, you know, I this is what I went to, this is what I thought I was doing in college. I thought I went to college to read the Bible more closely and, like, get to know it and maybe try out my theologian wheels. And, you know, I got I got too close and just... You know, I don't know how it worked out for you, Dustin, but I was like, great, like, really? <laughs> this is what, you know, I was under impre- I was underwhelmed by, um, by their, on- uh, by their authentic- authenticity, but then also like just the, the quality of knowledge, the quality of advice that they're giving people. You're going to go to a church and you're going to say, you know, stop being Jewish or something like that. Um, the law is fulfilled or something like that. And then you go to like, you know, you go to Hebrews and we're having a slightly different discussion, you know, it's a kind of a tricky, you know, but, but, but Christianity in my mind has this, has, the first thing that happens in Christianity that's worth talking about is not the Holy Spirit blowing around and doing whatever happened in Acts. The first interesting thing that happens is that there's a disagreement about what are we going to do with, what are we going to do with the law? And yeah. you know, I just couldn't get, I couldn't get past it or through it. <laughs> because, you know, if, if you're going to have a church, you have to have church politics. Right. <laughs> I realize that's the most important thing out of all of it. Who has the power and, and what are they going to do with it? Right. Yeah. You know, for, for me, it ended up being uh, finding out that things weren't as simple as I thought they were. And then just kind of moving through and being like, um, how do I actually justify that this is is accurate? And that was one of the, the biggest things that kept coming up. Also, just crazy logical inconsistencies. Like, how does the Trinity a thing Right. It's not actually supported in any legitimate part of the Bible. There's one little add-on in one of the uh, Johannine epistles, but that's it. And it's not in the earliest versions of it. So, okay, somebody added that later. Uh, and then just the whole concept of salvation is just insane when you actually think about it. Right. It's a se- I mean, it's like the worst setup ever. <laughs> yeah. I mean- 
Yeah, I can't. Oh, it's uh, it's tough. It's tough. And you know, when people, you know, when people spend their lives doing this stuff, you know, uh, and I have a lot of pastor friends just around my community, and they're so nice and they're sweet, and they work hard at doing their thing, and they work hard at counseling people, and they work really hard at making sure that the, the that the health of their of the community is, as far as they're concerned, is healthy. You know, and they and they're mostly you know, and I don't I don't know any you know, any douchebag pastors or anything like that. But, you know, I talk, I give, I really have tough conversations with them about, you know, uh, how it goes and how things are hanging together in the largest sense. Uh, for instance, I was, you know, everybody drops the problem of evil on their pastor as they should. Uh, and I feel, and I feel kind of bad for them cause I'm, you know, for a long, lately, or I'd say for the past five years, I mean, for all my pastor friends have gotten my problem of evil question, and I'm just really curious about what's their what's the best answer that's out there, you know. And I read the theo- you know, I've read enough theologians and and to to get a sense of what is the best available answer out there. And it's of course you know short, uh, but I really want my pastor friends to know that it's a short that it's a short answer and that they should they should either bite that bullet and be like, hey, here's the best I can do, and we're gonna make our way anyway. I'm comfortable with that. Or, or be like, you know what, it's, let's hang up the towel and I'm not trying, you know, and I'm not <laughs> trying to convert people, but like, let me ask, you know, let's get you to the fork in the road and, you know, let you, you know, work it out from there. Yeah. You know, and the, the problem of, of evil as, as far as the, the conundrums goes is one of the most theologized ones out there. Mm-hmm. So there are so many different answers for it. Uh, it. It really ends up being one of those that it just comes down to what were they told in school as to how to explain it. Right. Yeah. There's a few that might have done a few little additions, but you know, there's probably 10 or 15 different ways of responding to it. <laughs> now, I wouldn't be surprised if you've heard all of them by now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should catalog them actually, but I, 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 I've, try, I've tried to hear, I've accessed as many as I could for sure. And that's my sense of it as well. Cause I've definitely heard the same, you know, there's definitely five of them on the FAQ for sure. Yeah. What worked to deconvert me the best uh, was how can you actually justify the authority of scripture to somebody who doesn't believe that already? Mm hmm. That's a, yeah, that's a really great question. And I came out the other end with absolutely nothing. (laughs) There is no way. Right, right. Yeah, you know, the justification question is really a good one in knowledge. I mean, it's actually, it's kind of, well, it has a sour story, I guess. Um, You know, even, you know, in knowledge, in knowledge in the general sense, it doesn't have such a fantastic answer. Um, You know, I think of, you know, the Gettier examples or whatever, you know, this is the famous thing. Uh, and you know, but but you know, in any case, the the at least in religion, they're not even getting close to, you know, they're not quite getting in the. They're not even. I mean, they're in the ballpark, I guess, but they're not. They're still not dealing properly, I think, with uh, with the weight of the question. Um, yeah, that's a tricky. That's tricky territory for sure. But yeah, I, I imagine that you have collected all the answers that go with this. <laughs> uh, actually, I haven't uh, because you know I went through three or four different versions of it while I was, I was doing my studies. And by the time I was actually starting to get to the core, it turned out it's just existentialism. You accept it because you want it to be true. Right. I even had some professors admit that basically admit that that's, that's why they, they stuck with it. Nice. And that's, if all you've got is existentialism, that's not much. No, it's not. It's, you know, <laughs> analogously, that's how I answer the question of why do I eat meat still? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I mean, you know, just to just to be soft to them. But, it, but you know, I don't have any better than a like, oh, man, I'm really hungry sort of answer or all of this is what I crave or this is what I desire answer uh, to this important question, too. So I'm so Western. <laughs> nice. Does it taste good? <laughs> That's a bone. <laughs> I have a little bit better answer on that one. I'm allergic to almost all nuts and about half of fruits. Okay. So oh. it would be a little bit more, it'd be a, a real inconvenience to make sure I actually got sufficient nutrition without taking advantage of, of animals doing the work for me. Oh man, um, I'm going to have to use that one. Yes. That's, that's not a bad one at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm allergic to walnuts, but that's really all I know of. I'm going to I'm gonna have to say that, though. Hey, I, think, I, I think you're in the game, Wesley. Yeah. I think you're right in there. Food, I am food constrained. 
Yes. And thusly, I need a little, I need some more options. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, we're going to take another break. <laughs> Not bad. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. All right, Chris, what is... uh? What's your, your history with religion? It is inter. It's I've been pretty. It's very voluntary. So <laughs> when I was growing up, my, my nobody in my house went to church. Um, not even on Christmas and Easter or whatever people might do. Uh, so, but I was very interested in Christianity. I have a lot of aunts and uncles, and a couple of my one of my aunts was Mormon, and one of my aunts was very uh, non denominational Christian. And, Sorry, uh, I, I got a I got a quick question. Oh yeah, that that uh, Mormon family member, uh, white or black? Or? All white. So I only okay. I, and yeah, all my family's white because I didn't meet my I never I don't know any of my biological father's side at all. Yeah, okay. So all white church people. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, you'd go to church and always nice to you as a kid kind of thing. And I wasn't really fooled by that, but I was really interested in what was actually going on. And maybe I was interested in what the adults were talking about more than like the Sunday school sort of stories. And so growing up, whenever I was around, you know, one of, one of my aunts, I would always arrange for myself to go to church. Nobody ever made me, nobody ever said, don't do it or whatever. And it was actually kind of nice. It was, uh, it was freeing. And I got to learn, I got to learn everything I ever wanted to learn about Christianity. It took a long, kind of a long time. Uh, but I would arrange for myself to go. And, uh, you know, the Mormon church was always a little wonky kind of thing. Um, it's a funny place. Then, and, and I can't quite put my finger on what it was about them. They were all very nice, and I get the whole Mormon talk um, thing. Uh, and they were definitely had cool events. You know, when you be, I remember being a teenager and going to like courting events. They'd have like total dances <laughs> from all over the area for hundreds of miles, and people would come and try to you know whatever mate when you're 15. And that was great for me. That sounded that was great. Well, they um, sure know how to program the shit out of everything. They got, yeah, they totally got that down. Um, and then I, but I would mostly uh, go to, you know, sort of like four square churches or sort of just non-denominational, maybe just above um, fundamentalist flavor of churches. Uh, but, you know, maybe Pentecostal, but, you know, that charismatic flavor. Um, and they were always, always intriguing. It wasn't the speaking in tongues, but it was like this, you know, there's a... The speaking in tongues to the prophesying part was always like, what are you guys, what are we doing here? And it wasn't like I was, I wasn't quite smirking yet, but I was like, are we, is this serious? Like, is this, are we doing real stuff here? Um, How did the two compare? Well, between Mormon, between uh, the Latter-day Saints church and like my aunt's Pentecostal church. Yeah. Uh, one was a lot more freeing. I found the Pentecostal church to be more f- freeing, I guess. Uh, you were, you could be more active. The music was better. The oh, for sure. Uh, maybe the maybe the women weren't as cute <laughs> as a teenager. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Uh, but it was freeing in a lot of ways. You could really express your your however you wanted to express with God or however you wanted to worship God. You could do that really well. Um, so I think that's you know I guess in you know my my I mean I'm kind of uh, have some um, some puritanical you know, features about my personality, you know, puritan- puritanical disposition, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so, like, if I'm going to study something, I'm going to, like, get all I can out of it kind of thing. Very American pragmatic kind of thing. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so the Christian, so the, just the non-denominational church has really suited me. Um, but, you know, it really, and then, you know, so I arranged for myself to go, uh, when I was in the Air Force, I totally took myself to random churches all the time and had, you know, whatever church communities. And it wasn't until I got to private Christian college where I was like, you had to read the Bible very slowly and very carefully uh, that something became, and it wasn't the first time that actually something occurred to me. When, when I was 15, I read the Bible for myself for the first time. And I remember thinking to myself that when King David, uh, the whole King David and Bathsheba ex- like situation, 
you know, this there's a king. He goes and looks out and sees a naked woman. He's like, I'm, I got to have that. And he <laughs> arranges for that. Oh, she's married. And he has to, like, fin- you know, finesse the law and finesse all things that were principal to him to, like, make this happen. And I was like... And, and like and God, like you know, God killed his first son for the, you know, killed his first kid for that. But it was just like, like King David was wrong. Like King David was really out of bounds, and then God was like really messed, like messed up for killing a kid for being mad at King David. And that really, that always like that kind of bothered me. And you know what? <laughs> I was I was stupid for not stopping right then and being like, you know what? This is not. This is not how we conduct ourselves. Uh, and I mostly blame it on my parents, <laughs> like my parents for like not uh being i don't blame them but i i say to myself nobody before that suggested to me that this is not how we conduct ourselves and not that i was necessarily open to what king david was doing because it always rubbed me wrong um but nobody was like hey this is this is a no no and like this is a thing worth rejecting nobody ever suggested that to me and so as soon as i became aware that this was a thing worth rejecting i did instantly and i happened to be in my theology class with a you know a world class theologian i guess and nice. i didn't mind telling him <laughs> so kind of masochistic though uh, basically all of your religious studies you know as a child uh, were self inflicted and absolutely absolutely yeah, wow. yeah, and you know, and there's those Christians who would bite the bullet and be like, you know, what? God is sovereign, so He can kill you when He wants to, if your name is Onan or whatever. You know, what all the kill, you know, all of the genocide. I, I have a cousin who who is a professor at a at a little Bible college, and he he totally bites the bullet of of you know rape in the Bible is okay. And I ask him about this, and you know, I can't ask anything more of him. Like you're gonna bite slavery and rape and you're going to buy all of those bullets just so that for jesus really and, so he he goes the full like uh god is great and then mysterious ways oh absolutely wow but he yeah. but he's, yeah my professors want a little bit different approach on that uh they went with god was dealing with fallen people so he had to kind of help them back up one step at a time and and so, tried to put rules in to try to, to minimize how bad it was. Did God have to work on their level of on their level for a while and do bad stuff because people were bad also? Basically. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. It's not really a satisfying answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty tough. I think, yeah, I think that's what I'm surprised by my, you know, and actually we talked a little while ago about gay marriage when gay marriage became legal or the court ruling that came out and he posted a thing and you know, it's, it's hard for him because he's a pretty cool guy. Like he's, he's, you know, he's in part of his head is in 2016 for sure. But then the rest of him is not, you know, certainly his heart and the other half of his brain is not here. And he, um, once it rubs him, you know, and he's not even mad about it. He's just trying to, tiptoe back into a place where you know nobody really wants nobody's gonna but go back there uh and you know he just basically thinks it's wrong and he doesn't really give he just kind of says this is this is what it is and we're gonna carry it out as well as we can and if you don't want to then like i'm okay with some people going to hell and so the question becomes for him the question i ask him is how many like how many people do you think are going to be in hell and how many people do you think are going to be in heaven and and you know and I and then later, you know, eventually I usually hoist the like, you know, torture is so good <laughs> on them. <laughs> um, but but the idea is like how you know where on this on the spectrum of humanity do you do you think this is all going to shake out? And you know, and he and he isn't so privy to cl- classical cultures, for instance, for you know, for example. So he doesn't know like. What he doesn't have a sense of, you know, what humor was in classical culture, or what punishment meant, or what it even means to eat. He doesn't have a good sense of like how things were kind of going on then. He's really rationalizes a lot of things from from a Western perspective, uh, and it doesn't, you know, it's not it's not really helping him out that much. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and you tend to get that a lot more in the the more conservative uh, side of things because. At the point that you have to start looking at, you know, what was going on in the culture at the time, uh, and you try to read it in that context, it's a lot harder to stay conservative. I think I think that's right. Yeah, 
That's right. I mean, just for the fact that we that women vote now and that black people are, you know, you know, whatever, whatever our status is. <laughs> it's not, we're not slaves anymore, but we're still not having jobs and whatever else kind of goes along with that. Like, how are, however you work that that flavor of things. out. Yeah. You I mean, you can't not. equal on paper. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. I think that's right. <laughs> they spend the same money as we do. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think I think it's hard. I think. I think I think knowledge. I think understanding uh, reality is hard for Christianity, is my sense. You know, uh, at the end of the day, definitely. Unless you get into the the very uh, well, and actually, yeah, no, it just straight up is because you either have reality is difficult to hold a grasp of along with the conservative beliefs, or you go so liberal that you don't believe what you believe was real, mm-hmm. but then the real world actually makes sense. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Yeah, I know. I totally that definitely cuts both ways. Yeah, there's definitely. I mean, you know, and the and the idea, you know, the underlying idea is to not be dogmatic. Like, there's no doxa to how things kind of go. I mean, we're we might be the species right now, but you know, in a hundred thousand years, we're probably not going to be the species anymore. Oh yeah, we'll definitely be well different by then if we're still around. Right. If we're yeah, and and so you know you can't it's very unwise to go even within a single lifetime um, allowing yourself to think the same things all the time Yeah, or or that the rules aren't going to change. All right. Well, it's time for our last break. I I just want to say, I always like the thought of uh, everybody and everything is a transitional species. (laughs) Anyways. Yes. Yes. I like that notion. Definitely. Do you like this show? consider giving us some financial support to make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using paypal or patreon find out more at atheistnomads.com use the links on the right side of the page one dollar an episode is all we ask please think of the kittens all right <clears throat> yeah progress definitely does not stop <laughs> <laughs> not even if you wanted it to yeah yeah you know I, it, it, it yeah, gets... like like your cousin yeah. <laughs> i have a dirty little secret to tell you guys okay uh-huh. so when i was in college and still not quite out of religion i uh was you know you as one does you go to internships you take internships at jobs and for a little while, for about oh, se- about seven or eight months, I worked for the Discovery Institute. Oh, uh, nice! Yeah, that is- <laughs> and it was a it was a very fascinating experience that has definitely altered the way that I. Uh, it definitely altered. It, ch- it changed the way I, I was. It changed my profession. It changed my profession. It changed what I thought I wanted to do, and who I wanted to work for. That kind of thing. It, and it was really like a, you know, they were pretty. By the time I got there, they were already sort of under fire. Uh, the court case proceedings in Ohio versus whoever, whatever the case, whoever was the, the whatever the case names uh, were. Kitz Miller, I think that's right. Yeah, Kitz Miller uh, versus versus, versus Dover. Versus okay, that's right. And uh, I started working there when that was going on. And so what year was that? Uh, Would have been oh. Uh, that's uh, two thousand five. Was Kitz Miller. Okay. Okay. So, so, so 2005 to 2006. Okay. Uh, and it was a, it was kind of a, um, you could just f- feel how victim-y the place was. Oh, no. <laughs> it really felt like that. You know, so the guy, um, so it was, um, there was a, that was a guy, good time when they were feeling like they just got smacked too, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Big time. And everybody was in the house all whiny, like, uh, uh, <laughs> I think of like David Klinghoffer and he was this Jewish guy who wrote like a book called the shattered tablets or something like that. He'd come in every day and I didn't know any Jewish people. Uh, I knew about 10 times as many Jewish people today. Thanks to graduate school. As I did then. <laughs> this guy, David Klinghoffer was like, he was a, he, I shouldn't call him. Out. He was a fussy guy with me. Like I was an intern. So maybe it was some of that was that. And, uh, but certainly there's no other, there was like a Hispanic guy who was like on their board of things, but there was no black people. I'm totally the only black guy that was worked that probably has ever worked there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I can kind of, 
it was kind of, you know, I could kind of just do what I want. And I was, like I said, I was about a foot out of Christianity anyway. And I went to there to work there just to see what it would be like to work at a think tank and to see what these guys' work was really about. I knew there were, let's call them, in quote, scientists uh, trying to do work like Dembski, you know, and they were, people were trying to work out a view of theirs and and it was clear that this isn't how you conduct science in the first place that was the first thing that i knew that they had an idea of what result that they wanted in the first place this is just Mm -hmm. you do your work um and they were very explicit about getting fine about looking for results that supported their worldview and I think I think that's the main reason for their big shun. They I think that people wouldn't have been so grumpy or against or sort of anti discovery institute if they were like, hey, I could be wrong about this, but let's just see what happens. And my sense of reading their papers um, and talking with those guys that they weren't about you know trying to figure out what the answer was. They were like, hey, how can we squeeze this in? Mm-hmm. You know. I'm going to come up with the perfect puzzle that nobody, I'm going to come up with the perfect philosophical puzzle that nobody's going to be able to solve. And we're going to, you know, force our idea in there. Well, they, just, they're, they're in the position where scientists hate them because they don't do science, but they claim to liberals don't like them because, well, again, they're, they're trying to screw around with, with science wrong and conservatives don't like them because they're too liberal. I, I haven't thought about that last piece, but I, I was with you all the way then. But I, I think that, I think you're right about that. I mean, well, clearly you're right about that. I never liked the Discovery Institute. They were either too liberal with their their interpretation of things, or batshit crazy, insane uh, religious people. Yeah tough and it's tough to be out there for them i mean I, I felt bad i was a little you know you go out in public with the discovery institute and it, it got embarrassing actually <laughs> i was like oh my gosh i'm here with, I'm like here with these people <laughs> and you know they would have like they do the whole political thing where um they so they have other arms so there's the center for science and culture that's their big intelligent design group but then they also have a thing called the cascadia uh institute and they were all about transportation policy between in the cascadia district so uh california oregon washington and british columbia they there are people out there who have an idea of wanting to build a one big long transportation system out here that's maybe whatever nitrogen based or something like that or alternative you know alternatively mm-hmm. fuel and so there's some cool there's some cool nuggets tucked into there and they you know they would have parties in their house with you know department of transportation people from all of these places and so they were like you know so they the other facets of this discovery institute were were pretty genuine i think uh oh. but but they um, – and the person who runs that is a guy named Bruce Agnew who publishes a lot in the Seattle uh, Times and PI. And they're not – I'm not going to call them clever, but like they're not horrible ideas. They're not horrible things to advocate for. Um, and and so, you know, they're, they're – uh, you know, to not take away – you know, just to add to, to – to, be fair to their case. They were trying to do a lot of things. Um, and they were trying to do a lot of things for people who were, that they identify with. And I think, you know, and sometimes you just end up in the business end of, of either knowledge or, uh, money. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So the Cascadia thing, I mean, I've heard people talk about this for, well, ever in Washington state Mm -hmm. about breaking off from the U S and making their own country, because I guess technically we kind of could support Mm -hmm. ourselves. But uh, were they trying to do it just for that, or did they want to make like a Christian nation out of it? I'm guessing. Oh, my like, sense was that it was very, very transportation oriented because um, they didn't even ha- and you know they would have they had a couple of like ter- like <laughs> frankly just terrible ideas about how to conduct about how to shape transportation policy in the state. And I'll give you an example. So one big push that they wanted to do was they they had this trails and rails idea that they would use. Um, um, property that was used for for trains um, and you know like the sounder for example and they wanted to put like bike trails next to these things and uh, they would try to run them through neighbor you know the idea was that they wanted to run them through neighborhoods and it was just kind of like you know like I'm not really sh- you know I'm not sure like I'm not going to speak on the statistics related to people with bicycles doing their hobby or whatever next to trains and how that kind of shakes out 
Um, but you could probably get an idea that rails and trails, you don't generally, <laughs> they may or may not go together. Well, it depends go. on it if, if they're like, if the trains are up in the air or not. Well, no, no, the trains would be on the ground. It's like rail, it's oh. literally like rails on the ground and here's a bike trail next to it. And right. the idea is just to right. get them out of public, you know, public land. But, oh man, just the safety issues alone. The safety yeah. issue is just oh. the, the amount of, of wind shear you'd be dealing with when a train goes by. Yes. Yeah. That, and, yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, in, the sh- in the shape of the trail, yeah. Bikes and and rails work when you remove the rails and you just have a nice level or easy grade bike path. Yes. There's one just, of those in, in northern Idaho that, from what I hear, is absolutely amazing. Okay. So it was more like a, it was more like a bikes or rails kind of thing? And they were the trains bikes. had been uh, discontinued. Uh, they tore up the, the, uh, the tracks and... And so it was, yeah, just this nice, easy grade to get up into the mountains on a bicycle. Oh, nice. Nice. No, I think that's a clever idea. I think that's right. I think that, you know, it's 2016. We don't, however we ship things. I don't think we're just, I just think we're not using trail, the rail lines as much as we used to. There are ample of them that are available, that are empty. Um, or people trying to make money off of them. I guess that's probably what goes on on the backside. But uh, but you're right. Uh, nice, easy way, like easy access for people to do things that in a sustainable for the community ways is just a much better idea. Mm-hmm. I love the idea of like the light rail that goes from like SeaTac to Seattle, you know, mm-hmm. and it's up in the air for the most part. And, you know, rails and trails would work well with that. You know, just have a bike trail underneath the freaking train. Right that, right. that would be cool. And, you know, a community train, I, I think a lot of people would use that if it was actually available where it actually stops through neighborhoods. I don't know. Just no, I think, my I, thought. I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think they would probably, you know, groping towards something like that, uh, you know, eventually trying to find a good idea, I guess. Um, well, what I think is really one of the biggest issues is you have – what should be the final leg of the journey all being handled or handling the entire journey. So you have long haul trucks, triple trailer trucks doing long distances that is nowhere near as efficient as if that was on a train. Yes, it'd be a little bit slower, but it would be a lot more efficient. And if enough of that was being used, it'd be a lot cheaper. And then you just use small trucks for more of the local deliveries or getting to to rural places that, you wouldn't have train stations in. The same thing works with uh, transportation. There's there's areas like the Seattle area where buses and trains compete, and the buses are better in a lot of, of situations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where if you had the train as the central link in the the infrastructure, and buses just got you to that that final little bit, you could have some some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, no, I th- I think that's right. I agree. I agree with that actually. I always come from the uh, Japan angle where trains are freaking everywhere. (laughs) They crisscross everywhere. There's different uh, speeds of trains on the same track. Uh, So it's actually really cool. So, you know, if if you you, you can, say, pick the uh, blue, the green line, which is the slowest train stops at every stop. You have the reds, which only stop at major stops. And then the, the blacks that only hit, like, towns. Okay. So... So you can like speed through stuff really quick and get mm-hmm. here and there. And, you know, you only have to walk really maybe a few blocks before you, you hit a, a train stop, really. So mm-hmm. they're everywhere. It's amazing. They're fast. They're cheap. They're on time. It's from what I understand, they're like better than German, uh, Germany's trains. Mm-hmm. But, uh, nice. I don't know, man, I, I, I think it's one of the, the, the worst things in our nation that uh, we don't take care of our, our rail, railways like we are supposed to. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, I, like you're saying, the, infra- inf- the the ability to move infrastructure around, like all these supplies on, from one end of the country to the other, is just mm-hmm. mind-boggling with a good train. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, and I, I, I live in, in uh, Boise, and in the Treasure Valley, there's a lot of people who commute long distances. And like in particular from... Napa Caldwell area to Boise and and vice versa. And so you end up having huge traffic bottlenecks on on the freeway when there could be a central train line that just runs basically parallel to the freeway, go from downtown Boise to downtown Caldwell, and it could cut travel times drastically. It could free up uh, the 
capacity on the freeway. They could probably drop lanes in, in a couple areas. And it's the perfect area to try to do like a medium-sized city mass transit system because buses don't work. But if you had a train that ran right down the center and then every mile or two shuttle vans running north-south, uh, it would it would work beautifully. I like that idea. I'd be all for that. Yeah. Like just have the trains go the, the long-ass distances past the mm-hmm. highways and then buses when you get to the towns and it's the perfect place for it because the freeway basically does east west the trains do east west and where people live is north or south of that oh i like that there's this is something that i've thought of and then found out they've already been trying to get this to happen here but the people who (laughs) want it to happen and the people who would fund it are uh, not seeing eye to eye Right. That's right. So they're Republican. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's put it this way. The (laughs) Democratic leadership in the city of Boise loves the idea. The Republican controlled state government doesn't. Sounds about on par. Yeah. Oh, Idaho. (laughs) (laughs) And the legislature, when they're in session, they just want to get through it as quickly as they can so they can go back to their real jobs. They're like, I have so much people work at work right now. My I've law got firm a, is drowning. Uh, I've got a farm to run. <laughs> <laughs> it's farmers and lawyers and a few business people. Like one doc. <laughs> uh, a couple of retired doctors and uh, a couple teachers. Oh, teachers, man. Oh, that's a step I, up. I'm guessing the uh, Idaho Teachers Union worked it out somehow that they can keep their jobs and take four months off in the middle of the year to go work in the legislature. Mm. It's just P.E., guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean music. <laughs> uh, I'd be thinking if they actually still taught civics, that'd be an awesome opportunity for the civics teacher. Oh, yeah. about right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, how would you still to- teach physics? Yeah. Oh, it'd be so great to have your instructors be the person. Oh, I mean, like, I feel, you know, maybe this is a thing. I would love to, like, if every mayor, if a mayor of every city taught at the high school, and that was just a feature of how mayors get their work done. I go teach mm. high school kids or whatever. This would be a beautiful, enriching experience in the same way that you're just Yeah, saying. teach government class. Yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> is, that, is that asking too much? <laughs> <laughs> well, considering in most cities, uh, mayors are just figureheads. Uh, no, I don't think you are asking too much. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my sense. Or like the commissioners. Yeah. And then if, and if your town has a laboratory... Like send somebody to do the science, like do with, I mean, it, and you know, maybe they're like the specialty classes, right? Maybe they're not the poor classes, you know, maybe it's not biology, but maybe there's like a, you know, how to act like an adult in science for high school students. I don't know. Yeah. The problem I see with some of that is the, uh, the, the tendency would then start getting towards, especially with the government side, that the students then end up writing all the bills mm-hmm. and children write terrible legislation. <laughs> it's slightly worse than what actual politicians do i don't know if they could actually do worse i don't know if they yeah you know have you been listening to clean schmidt <laughs> <laughs> the few student written bills i've heard of are are pretty bad well they're from like fourth graders who's a dad whose dad was like hey <laughs> well you know maybe the dad was an attorney or whatever but Please make our state animal a marmot. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Okay, there was one uh, here in Idaho. I actually got to meet her. She was uh, started it when she was, I think, ten, trying to get the state to have a uh, state amphibian in Idaho. Okay. The Idaho giant salamander. Uh, It's something pretty much only. I think they've been found once or twice in Montana, but other than that, only found in Idaho. They're about a foot long, uh, pretty cool uh, thing. And she was trying to get the legislature to do it and kept pushing. It took her four and a half years to get it actually passed. And it had all started as just some little uh, letter writing thing that they had to do for social studies class in like fourth grade. And it took her till eighth grade to get it finished. Wow. Well, that actually sounds like it was right on right on track then. Yeah. Four years. And what was funny was uh, that last year, so it was last year that that it finally went through, uh, they had said that no, they would not be giving it time 
because they had more important things to do. And then they started doing some really unimportant things in the legislature. So finally, they got enough uh, flack that they went ahead and gave it a vote. <laughs> and there was actually, I think, one of the committee members in the committee that had to go through that actually said to her, all right, if we pass this, will you leave us alone? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. They like, just yeah, wanted her to go away. <laughs> I'm leaving the state for college since you guys are taken forever. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to be a vandal? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Stay out of politics. You know, in science, here's the thing. You don't even have to conduct an experiment. I mean, you, you do a little write-up. You do a little publishing, you know, with your clear writing. And you, and then, you know, people are out there commenting on your stuff and you could be a mover and shaker in, in not a lot of time. I mean, it might take 90 days to wow. do your thing, do the write-up, send it to somewhere and, you know, get it farmed out for publishing. And then people will engage in a serious conversation with you. And, you know, I feel like and the, the government doesn't quite go so, so smoothly. And it's true that science is harsh. Uh, but I th- but people are working really hard in both spheres, and it, you know I think one is much more efficient about producing knowledge and producing uh, policy, producing knowledge that's worth that su- suggests things that are worth the poli- policy change. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I yeah I just I don't know I think maybe the government could be more scientific in the way that it conducts itself. Oh, definitely. I wish there was more scientists in the government. That's what yeah, I was going to say. If we get more scientifically literate, Peter, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. One idea I heard when I was on the International Air Cadet Exchange was a uh, British cadet who thought our Senate should be more like their House of Lords. Mm. Nonpartisan, or at least less partisan, uh, and experts that get appointed to it because they are actually worthwhile. <laughs> It'd be like kind that. of interesting if we had like different fields and industries that had got to select people to go there. So like doctors got to pick a couple doctors to serve in, in the Senate and uh, physicists got to as well. And it just kind of, it'd, it'd be kind of interesting. That would be kind of interesting. I, f- I feel like the, uh, the different governmental organizations, you know, like the NIH and the FDA and the, those other groups do a pretty good job of tapping into the expertise mm-hmm. um, that's available. I don't know. I, it's hard for me to say if they're, I don't find it to be world-class expertise, but I find it to be pretty dang good. I mean, America is just in this position of having so much, having so many knowledgeable people, knowledgeable people and maybe not always the best universities, but in terms of, you know, the the universities in the United States definitely outweigh the world's universities. There aren't other countries that have a better university system than we do, or a higher, you know, at least produce higher quality people um, from those from those programs. Well, the problem I see with that is that you know they they get the the good people in to give them to feed the government people good information, but those government agencies aren't really listening to that information, or at least in a position to actually put out good policy mm-hmm. yeah like the, the fda i think one of their biggest issues is they don't have the time they, they have need too to much hire to do more people. right i think that's right my, my my definitely my sense of them is that they're they have a lot it's a big com, very big complex organization uh and I, th- I think you're right dustin they do have too much to do such that you literally like file your paperwork for your brand new device and the fda doesn't get back to you then you can start your experiment or you can start you know you're approved if nobody gets, if they're in the situation where you submit something and they don't get back to you, and then that's an okay enough instead of them getting back to you and saying, "Hey, this is a great idea. We actually thought about this, and let's go ahead." Um, that's a, that's a big, you know, that's a big fundamental thing. Yeah, and even with the, just their inspection service, uh, the biologics inspectors, because they're not technically supposed to be that specialized, but they they do specialize. Uh, they all got pulled over to take care of the peanut crisis in 2008 okay basically everybody working for fda with a inspector title all had to try to find out what was going wrong with peanuts okay wow and it put all other inspections on hold as long as we're talking about the government Mm -hmm. um, i've got something to report that just got announced on katu which is a basically one of the, the main TV stations down in Oregon. Hmm. Uh, leader of Oregon occupation, Ammon Bundy, and at least eight others detained. Uh, oh, wow. So, Holy crap. So, uh, shots were fired. Um, but they don't know what's going on, really. But uh, 
Uh, KATU News has learned the leader of the armed occupation uh, has been detained along with eight others. Officials say it all began with a traffic stop while Bundy and some of his followers were uh, en route to a community meeting in John Day, about 70 miles away. Uh, shots were fired, uh, but they don't know who, sh- who shot first. Wow. Uh, FBI agents, Oregon State Troopers, and other law enforcement agencies made the stop. Mm. Oh. Yeah, yeah, the uh, one of the Boise local stations is also reporting on it, and uh, they are a little bit less certain on that report. Mm. Okay. They've hmm. got question marks, and the only things they have been able to verify is that St. Charles Medical Center in Bend has a helicopter on the ground at the Harney District Hospital in Burns, uh, and that U.S. Highway 395 between Burns and John Day is shut down. KTU is saying that CNN reports it's unclear who shot first, so apparently CNN is in on this too. Wow, yeah. that's you know throughout this whole thing, I've I've been thinking about one about one thing. Uh, a few weeks ago, are we allowed to talk about other podcasts? <laughs> Yeah, I was listening sure. to uh, uh, on Skating A. There was uh, Bryce Blakenagle was on there, and he over a couple of episodes he told this incredible story about these Mormons who slaughtered these people who were heading out west. <laughs> and I've and I've been thinking about these guys the whole time. Like, you know, they're out up in the up in the mountain, you know, whatever up in the mountains or out in the woods or whatever. And there's this Mormon group of people, and there's I don't know. I just it, there was a lot of great things that uh, Bryce laid out in his in his uh, uh, description of that episode that really uh, not not that they sounded analogous in any way, but there was just a lot of like interesting features, you know, so well, Mormon, so Mormon. <laughs> the, the Bundys and a lot of the the heads of these uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call them terrorist groups or freedom fighters, whatever bullshit are uh, Mormons also. So yeah. 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 It's a fascinating, fascinating group. Yeah. We have a survivalist convention coming to Boise and uh, the leader of that is, is Mormon. Okay. Nice. Uh, We're going to be going to that. Oh yeah. That'd be awesome. I will definitely (laughs) be uh, recording some thoughts, maybe some interviews. It should be interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Hang, hang your, uh, your your phone out of your pocket so you can like videotape all this shit. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Bring a little dat, just record. Yeah. So the uh KTVB in Boise has a news crew headed to Burns to get the full scoop. Okay. Uh yeah, I found the K A T U one that you were talking about. Um looking yeah, it looks like they finally just caught them while they were driving. Yeah, it's not like those motherfuckers have been holed up on that pl- uh, in that place all yeah. the time. They're just like trolling around, trying to la, la, fucking go to the store and shit and getting Twinkies and other like, snacks. You know, it sounds to me like this is this is a way that the government would like do its work anyway. Hey, why don't you guys come on down to a community meeting here? We're gonna like <laughs> have a discussion about how to do things, <laughs> and then when you're in route, it's like snap. And I feel like people like. Uh, What's his name? Julian Assange. He knows this. He knows not to leave the well, building. <laughs> except they they went to a community meeting last week in, in Burns, Burns with oh. a judge present Okay, at the meeting. Had everybody bitching at them, and they all got to go back to the, the wildlife refuge. Okay. Yeah, even even the people that agree with, with what Eamon and everybody's doing, like, mm-hmm. get the fuck out of our town. Yeah. Uh, but the... Uh, the sheriff in this other town that they were heading to uh, is definitely on their side. So uh, definitely willing to back them somehow. Interesting. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm very glad they, well, caught them. If, if that's really the case, we'll see. But, right. Ooh. So what is concerning me about this uh, reporting is it's all being reported by ABC News and CNN from what I'm seeing so far. You would think it'd be somebody local. I thought KTU was like, well, Oregon local. Yes, but they're citing CNN. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Well, huh. still, I can hope. <laughs> I know, right? They're like, no, somebody just brought up more snacks and stuff. <laughs> they're going to be okay for another three weeks. Yeah. They're going to be fat, but they're going to be okay when they get out of there. Glitter bombs, bags of dicks, <laughs> and double stuffed Oreos. All right, Oregon Live has something that looks a little bit better. They have timelines. 
Okay. To 6.18 p.m., a uh, spokeswoman for St. Charles Health System in Bend said that the uh, ambulance was dispatched to... Airlink ambulance was dispatched to Burns. Uh, she did not... Wasn't able to confirm how many people it was going to retrieve oh. or whether so or not uh, Ammon Bundy was part of them. So that's just a little over a half hour ago. So we're like yeah, almost live on this shit. And did confirm that uh, it was on the ground there. Uh, 6.13... PM, Oregon Department of Transportation closed 56 miles of US 395 between Burns and John Day after unconfirmed reports that Ammon Bundy was taken into custody. And that goes from milepost 12 south of Canyon City to milepost 68 just outside of Burns. Mm. Damn, that is basically the entire highway there. Wow. Oh, man, oh, man. There's a whole lot of fringe people that have been, well, at least talking like they were going to go down. Some seriously wackadoo kind of people. So this needs to get done. 5.46 p.m. Two people have been shot and Ammon Bundy is in custody, according to a live stream report by Pete Santilli. The self-styled journalist is also reporting the FBI has told protesters at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in Harney County that they are free to go and need to leave immediately. <laughs> well, they're way more kind than I would be. Yeah, they need to be arrested for... Fucking treason. Treason, uh, sedition. Uh, there's a, n- a number of things. Uh, vandalism, trespassing. There's so many things they could arrest them for. They vandalized that uh, Native American uh, dig, didn't they? Uh-huh. Yeah. Motherfuckers. Just took a, a fucking uh, plow to it or something. Yeah. And Santilli said he was waiting outside the hospital in Burns to actually confirm the reports of the shootings. But the Oregonian or Oregon Live could not independently confirm the reports. Okay. So, yeah, we have unconfirmed reports. Hopefully they're accurate. <laughs> oh, man. If those people were any other color than white. That would have been a done deal. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're like, wait, you've been there for 20 minutes and you haven't moved along? What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have so- a guy with a shield and a helmet and a giant stick. Actually, there's 40 of us. <laughs> We're called the government. <laughs> oh, uh, we all watch Thelma. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think we are about out of time. Yeah, man. This has been a hell of fun. So glad you came on finally. Yeah, no, I'm super glad to have joined you guys. Um, Dustin and I haven't had a good chance to chat ever. So this mm-hmm. is really, yeah, I'm glad. And I see you way too often. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's never often enough. All right. So, Chris, do you have anything to plug? You know, I kind of don't. Uh, get consent. When you are when you want to do something with somebody else and it's questionable, get consent. I'll plug for that. All right. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a blast. Awesome. Thanks again. And for See our you. listeners, we'll be back next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.